Good morning, church. Thank you. We had one good morning. I appreciate it. That was awesome. Uh, if you're new this morning, my name is Jacob Ray. I'm the worship pastor here, and uh, I've just about completed my whole first month, and uh, so I'm, I'm loving it. Glad to be here. If you're a guest today, we are so thankful that you've decided to come and worship with us today, and uh, we would love to um, answer any questions you have or reach out with you in any, to any, anything you have, uh, concerns or anything that you need to be, uh, to be addressed. Uh, we'd love to reach out to you. So we have a, a number that you can actually text us if you've got questions. Maybe you want to know how to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, how to know him. Um, maybe you want to know how to uh, join the church. Please text us and let us know your questions here. We'll, we'll get back with you and get in touch with you. Or if you have a prayer request, anything like that, we will pray for you and, and hopefully meet you where you are and minister to you. And so we're, we're thankful that you are here. For those of you who are our regular attenders and members, thank you for being here for this service. I hope you had a great, great time and, and of encouragement in your life group. And uh, we're going to have, uh, this is hopefully just continuing on, worshiping the Lord, looking at John 3 today. Um, so one thing we want to highlight today is we want to talk about the sanctity of human life. This is something that our church values and that we uh, believe in. We believe that the Lord instructs that uh, he gives life. He is the creator of life, and life begins in the womb. Life begins at conception. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, Brother Ronnie talked about how uh, John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb. And so we believe that scripture teaches this. And we want to we wanna pray for and help support a couple local ministries this morning. First Choice uh, Pregnancy Medical Center and Heart to Heart. These are two local ministries in the River Valley that um, help families and help women and help children um, if they're in a situation that they don't know what to do, and they point them to Jesus, but they also help with where they are right now at the moment. And so we want to pray for these ministries and let you know their information should be on the screen if you have any uh, questions or if you want to reach out to them, how you might could support them. Two direct uh, prayer requests they've asked for, for, for from us. Uh, first choice is expanding their facilities, and so they've asked us to pray as they, as they grow and as their space grows, and they are also uh, be going, beginning a mobile ministry where they're going to be going to campuses and they're going to be going to meet people where they are uh, for some of those who might not be able to come to their center. So we want to pray for those things this morning and pray for them. Would you join me as we pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we know that life comes from you, that you are the sustainer of life. Lord, that you are our creator. And Lord, we recognize that um, it's a miracle. It's a miracle when you allow somebody to be pregnant, to have a child. And um, Lord, we, are, we just recognize that as a church today, the importance of the human life. Lord, we thank you for these local ministries. We thank you for these, Lord, that are giving of their time and investing so that they might help others and point them to Jesus. We pray for these two ministries, Lord, specifically as they grow and as their influence and their outreach grows, Lord, we pray for just blessing over their ministry. We pray for increased opportunities to share the gospel. We pray for increased opportunities to point people to Jesus and to help people out with their physical needs so that they might help them with their spiritual needs. We pray for this mobile ministry, God, that this might bring just dividends of great ministry, Lord, and that we would see people um, reached for the gospel because of this. And ultimately, Lord, we just praise you for these ministries. We pray that you'd be glorified through their work and glorified in our support of their efforts. Lord, as we sing together today and as we worship and as we pray and as we study your word, God, we pray that you'd be glorified in our midst. We pray, Lord, that we would be drawn to the beauty and the wonder of who you are. Lord, that we would rest on you, our cornerstone, that we would be drawn to the gospel of what it means to be born again. Lord, and that we would come to meet with you, no matter what we're going through, no matter what struggle, that we would come humbly. We are broken. We need to be mended. We are desperate for you, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you would meet with us this morning and that you would glorify your name alone in this place. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we begin singing today? We're going to begin singing Cornerstone, that Christ alone is our cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus 
Please be seated, church. I'm going to ask you to draw your attention to the, the baptistry. This is my niece. This is Emberlyn, um, and she went to her mom a few weeks ago, and her mom was the one that, that prayed with her, and um, she had asked me to do it, and I've baptized a few people. I was able to baptize my children and stuff, and I'm just as excited to baptize Emberlyn uh, as I did 
them and like I said I was she did not come to me she went to her mother but we are tools that God has given us there is nothing special that I've done that Jennifer's done it's what God has done for us and so I'm just a dude that loves Jesus and so I want the people around me to know that too and so I'm just so glad that that she is here today. So, Amberlynn, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you promise to follow him to the best of your ability for the rest of your life? Yes. Now, you know that this baptism is not what saves you, but it's that acceptance of Christ, right? Yes. yes. Okay. So, I baptize you, my new, uh, new friend in Christ, and as my niece, buried with him in baptism. <laughs> Raised to walk in newness of life. Man, what a great way to start our service this morning with a baptism. We're going to move to a time of prayer, but before we do, I want to read uh, some of our text this morning to you and let it be what guides us into our time of prayer. We're going to read John 3, and we're going to read the first three verses of this chapter. It says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader, who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. This morning, we, we come to this place to worship, and, and my hope is, is that as we look at these things and we think about worship and as we live our lives as believers, that we're not just looking for the, the signs and the things around us, but that we know that we can see who God is and how God works because he is the one who has changed us from the inside. To be reborn, this picture we see of baptism, for God to change us from the inside out, to have that new birth in the spirit, to know how to live and to follow him, that's what we are called to. For that is what we are living for. So this morning as we come and we worship and we enter this time of prayer, asking God to help us and revive our hearts, to change our hearts, that we understand that it's not by our effort, but it's by how, what he has done for us in that rebirth. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, this morning we are so thankful for Emberlyn to see this, this transition from death to life that you have given us through your spirit. Father, the baptism, this testimony to the world that she is now a follower of Christ. Father, as believers in this place, we are grateful for that moment when you changed our lives, when you moved us from death to life. And so this morning we come to praise you for that. We come to praise you for what you have done for us and to live our lives so that the world around us might see what you have done in us. And when they see that, they would be drawn to you so that your name would be glorified further. So, Father, we ask this morning as we stand and sing that we would worship you with hearts that are full, that as we listen to your word, we would listen intently to see the truth that you have for us, that we might glorify you in our lives as we leave this place. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to continue singing. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see.
church. Let's sing this out. Because of who he is, this is our response. Just as I am without one, please sing that out.
that song says that we glory in the cross. And that doesn't make sense in our culture, that we would glory in something of death and something of torture. But we can glory in the cross because Jesus paid the penalty for us. And we can come, just as we said, broken. We can come wounded. We can come desperate. We can come empty because we glory in the cross. So can we sing that one more time, just that chorus, just the voices in the room, no instruments. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the church. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I don't know of a a better way to look at John chapter 3 than what this song has has led us to focus on. As Jacob said, just the the glory of the gospel, the glory of the cross. You know, the song, as many of you know, we mentioned this the other week, is has been a tradition as an invitation song. It's a song that would be uh, sung as people were responding. And, and again, when you, when you get to chapter 3 of John, that's exactly what is called for, is a response. That's what, what Jesus was doing with Nicodemus, calling for a response. I, I'm going to go to the very end of my sermon because I think I, I want you to, to get this focus even before we start. In verse 7, Jesus says this to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, the question that I'm going to ask you at the very end is simply this. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? I mean, of all the questions that we can ask, one of the most basic questions is, how does a person get to heaven? Maybe somebody has asked you that. Maybe you've asked that question. The thing that makes that question so important for us to look at today is because there are so many people with so many different answers to that question. I hear people say, man, just believe. Well, believe in who? Believe in what? People say, well, you know, if you just be a good person, try to do good things. Well, really the issue is, What does the Bible say about how a person gets to heaven? And that's what's answered right here in John chapter 3. Jesus will say, "Uh, unless you are born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. And so again, the question that I, I pose at the beginning and will do so at the end, have you been born again? I had a lady in the 8 o'clock service when I asked that question. She's sitting at the back, and she said, yes! <laughs> I just spit on, watch the front row here. But I hope that that's, that's your response this morning. But if not, man, you're here on a great Sunday. And John chapter 3 does a, a great job in this conversation that you're going you're gonna to see and read of Jesus and Nicodemus that Jesus lays out in a very simple way of expressing how a person can get to heaven. You must be born again. Well, let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for the, for the worship through song and prayer that we have experienced, for the baptism that we were able to, to see as a testimony of of the power of your salvation. Lord, I pray that as we now open our Bibles and come to this third chapter of the book of John, that, Lord, truly you will speak. Lord, if someone is here that could not answer that question, that they have been born again, 
Lord, speak to their hearts. Or maybe that, just that term born again, maybe is confusing. Lord, help us this morning through your Holy Spirit. Bring clarity to your word. Help us to understand it, not just in our heads, but Lord, as Kyle prayed, Lord, let it be a heart change this morning. And Lord, for those of us who may be answered yes, God, may your word be fresh in our hearts. May it renew this love we have for you. And Lord, may we walk out of here with a commitment to know you and love you and serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you come to chapter 3, hopefully you get your Bible open to that. When you come to chapter 3, what, what you have here is a conversation, but it's one of three. When you get to chapter 4, Jesus is going to have a conversation with the, the, the woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman. And then a little later on in chapter 4, he's going to have a conversation with a, a government official. And they're really all under the context of the last part of chapter 2. So I want to, before we read and look at chapter 3, look at the last three verses again that we looked at last week of chapter 2, verse 23, 4, and 5. It says, Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. Remember we said last week, what this simply means is that the Lord knows our hearts. He knows your heart this morning. He knows exactly what's inside. And so when he comes to Nicodemus, he knows what's going on in Nicodemus' heart. It's important to understand. So let's look at this conversation. Verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish rel religious leader who was a Pharisee. Now, in that first verse, what you really find are the credentials, the religious credentials of Nicodemus. I put that there in your notes. If you're taking notes, that's the first point there, verse 1. And I want you to pay close attention to the term Pharisee. That's what Nicodemus was, a religious leader. There were about 6,000 Pharisees at this time, and a Pharisee was someone who was committed and devoted to God's law. I mean, they were strictly abiding by every law that was listed in the Old Testament. They were passionate about obedience. Uh, their righteousness uh, was, was on display. I mean, everybody knew that if you were a Pharisee, you were somebody that was, was uh, pretty holy, you obeyed the law. And... and, and when you look at the Old Testament, there's a lot of laws. Uh, there's about 613 laws in the Old Testament. About 248 of them are laws that have to do with doing something. 365 of them have to do with not doing something. And so the Pharisees were just committed to obeying the law. And, and let me just give you an example of how crazy they were with this. They would get so, so passionate about obeying specific laws that they would make other laws to help them to obey the law that was written in the Bible. I'll give you an example of this. Who can tell me what the fourth commandment is? You got ten. What's the fourth one? Okay, Bible quiz here. Nobody, nobody's got it, right? Fourth commandment. Somebody take a stab. Okay, I'll tell you. Do what? You're close. You're close. Yes. Do what? Nope. Fourth commandment, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And fourth commandment, all right, you learned something this morning, all right? Go back and learn your Ten Commandments, all right? Fourth commandment, if I was a Pharisee, I would have went, mm-mm-mm. You should know those commandments. They would take the fourth commandment, honor the Lord's day, remember the Lord's day, and keep it holy. <laughs> they began making laws called Sabbath day laws. They added laws to this fourth commandment so that they would make sure that they obeyed this fourth commandment. For instance, they made a law that on the Sabbath day, if you picked up a stick, you broke the law. It was, it was a, a law that you couldn't pick up a stick. They even had a law, if, if you had a chair and it was in your way and you needed to move it, 
you just broke the law. That's how crazy it was. And I mean, you can go and look in, in, in Jewish history and find all these Sabbath laws that the Pharisees made. I mean, we're talking tons of laws just because they were so passionate about obeying the law. That was Nicodemus, a religious leader who was a Pharisee. Look at verse 2. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Now, why did he, why did he come at night? Some people believe he was a coward. Some people believe he was afraid of what the other uh, Pharisees might think of him. I tend to think that he came because he wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with Jesus. Remember the context, Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was performing all these miracles. Obviously, a big crowd was around. There's no way he could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the midst of that during the day. So he came at night so he could meet with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And this is what he said. He said, Rabbi, now let me stop there. That, that term rabbi was really a term of respect. If you call somebody a rabbi, that meant that you respected them as a teacher. Nicodemus was a rabbi. So he's calling Jesus. He's respecting Jesus as a, as a, as a brother in, in, in what they did. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, again, I think what you see here, God's working in Nicodemus's life, drawing him to Jesus. I think there is a, I, some people would read that and go, well, obviously Nicodemus didn't get it. Well, again, Jesus knows Nicodemus's heart. And so Jesus immediately goes right to the issue. And look at verse three. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Your Bible might say verily, verily. In other words, he's saying what I'm about to say, listen carefully. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, here's what, in essence, Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. Hey, Nicodemus, you've got all these religious credentials. You've been, you've been obeying me. You're a great teacher. I mean, you're a respected Jewish leader. But that's not enough. That's not enough. You can put all that out here, Nicodemus. It's what's on the inside. You must be born again. So in your notes, you might want to just write this. Religious credentials are not enough to save you. That's in essence what he was saying here in verse 3. Now he's going to explain what it means. In fact, he'll say two more times and refer to being born again. But notice what Nicodemus says in verse 4. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Now, again, Nicodemus was an intelligent man, teacher, respected Jewish leader. And, and the Bible notes right here, he was, he was older in age. So Nicodemus wasn't naive to think, okay, Jesus, you mean I got to go back into my mother's womb? No. Here's what Nicodemus was in essence saying, and this is what he realized. You mean Jesus I got to start over. I got to go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, remember, Nicodemus was a, a leader among the Pharisees. He was a, a respected teacher. And so obviously he, he knew the law, he obeyed the law. And now Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you got to start over. You got to go all the way back to the beginning. Basically what he was saying was, Nicodemus, you got to realize how empty you are on the inside. Yeah, you might have all the credentials. You might be looking good on, on your obedience performance, and, and you might know a lot of Bible, but Nicodemus, you're lost. You got sin in your heart. And so Jesus was just bringing Nicodemus to that point of needing to be broken over his sin, needing to come to Jesus and admitting that he is spiritually bankrupt. Now, there's another Pharisee that had that same experience. Anybody ever heard of the Apostle Paul? <laughs> he was in a Pharisee. In fact, hold your place there in John. Go to Philippians chapter 3. You're in John. You go to Acts and Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Look at this. Look at these verses. This is Paul's 
testimony. Paul was, an, Paul was a, a, a Pharisee, and notice what he says. Chapter 3, verse 7. He says, I once thought these things were valuable. Now, what are these things that he's referring to? Well, just look up above in verse 5. He says it. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. <laughs> and then look at verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable. But now, I love this, I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else. In other words, he had to start over. I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. <laughs> I mean, all his righteousness all his obedience to the law. So what he's saying, he's counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. That's where Nicodemus needed to get to. And so when he said, Jesus, you mean I got I to gotta start over? I got, I got to go back to the beginning? Yeah. Well, notice what Jesus says. Look at verse 5. This is his reply. Jesus said, I assure you. In other words, verily, verily again. Or here's something that you need to listen to, Nicodemus. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being, here it is. Here's the explanation of what born again means. Without being born of water and born of the Spirit. Born of water and born of the Spirit. So now you might ask, well, okay, what is that? I mean, I didn't really understand what being born again means. Now you say that this is what it means to be born of water and born of the Spirit. So what does that mean? Well, born of water, Jesus was going all the way back to the Old Testament. If you recall, we were in Hebrews, we talked about this. For a priest to go into the Holy of Holies, to be able to be in the presence of God... He had to go through all this washing. I mean, it was amazing the, the kind of emphasis was placed on, on him being clean, washing his hands, washing his garments over and over. That water purification was a big part of the symbol of being clean before God. And so when Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you got to be born of water. He was telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you need your sins forgiven. You need your sins washed. Jesus wasn't talking about literal water. And there's some people who look at that, you got to be born of water, that maybe Jesus was referring to literal water. And, and, and maybe, maybe baptism is, is, is what the picture is of that, that when you're baptized, or you know, and they were baptizing people in that day, you're going to see that when we get to chapter 4, that maybe that water baptism cleanses you. No. I mean, think about this for a minute. If Jesus was referring to water baptism here, he said, if you have to be born of water, you have to be cleansed with water, it makes sense that his three years in ministry, he would have done nothing but try to baptize as many people as he could. If you've got to be baptized in order to go to heaven, then man, line up, get in line. We've got to baptize as many people as we possibly can baptize. But he didn't. When Emberlin was baptized this morning, when Zach took her under the water, that, that's, that's really the, the definition of baptism, which is immersion. It was a symbol that when she trusted Jesus and what he did on the cross, he forgave her all of her sin. She was washed. When she, you're saved, you're born of water. In other words, you are washed clean of your sin. That's, a, that's the reality of being born again. You've been forgiven. How do you do that? How did that happen? Well, that's why Jesus said born of water and born of the Spirit. 
Look what else he says. Jesus went on to explain this. Verse 6, humans can produce, reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. In other words, the realization of being born again, what, what really it means is that you need forgiveness of your sins, and how that happens, the Holy Spirit takes that sin away, gives you a new heart. In fact, the Old Testament made this very clear. In fact, when you get to verse 10 and, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, you should have known this because this is what the Bible teaches. You should have known this. I want you to hold your place there and go to Ezekiel chapter 36. It's just one place. There's several in the Old Testament that, that spell this out. Ezekiel, as a prophet, speaks God's word here about the new covenant. And here's how he explains it. Look at verse 25, chapter 36. If you can't get there, just listen. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Now, is he talking literally? No, he's not talking that that's how you get saved, Does somebody sprinkle water on you. No. Again, the imagery of, of being cleansed, just like water would cleanse you. So, he says, Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. Verse 26 and I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take away your stony, stubborn heart. I will give you a tender, responsive heart. Now get this, verse 27. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And so it's the spirit being born of water, being forgiven of our sins. How does that happen? Through the Spirit, through God's Holy Spirit. Now, go back to chapter 3. Notice what Jesus says. He goes back to Nicodemus and he says this, verse 7. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Now, let me just draw attention to the word must. You're looking in the Greek and that really is the emphasis right here. He's already said up in verse 3, you must be born again or you, you need to be born again. He, he says that, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again. He says it again in verse 5. In verse 7, he says you must be born again. He didn't say you should be. doesn't say you ought to be. You better be. He said you must be. It's necessity. But notice what he says here. Verse 8, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. Here it is so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. But now get the point here. Okay, you can't understand it. I mean, how does the Holy Spirit come into our heart? How are we forgiven of our sins? <laughs> Jesus said, listen, you, you can't understand that, but here's what you can understand. He gives a great illustration here. He says, just like the wind blows, if you go home today, you look out the window, and you see your trees doing this, you don't go, oh my gosh, what's happening? No, you go, man, the wind's blowing really hard. You can't see the wind. You don't know where it's coming from. But you see the effects of it. You see those trees. And we don't understand how the Spirit works in our heart, how our sins have been removed out of our heart, but we do see the effects of it. You know, we say all the time around here, man, we can't see in people's hearts. I can't. You can't walk up to me this morning and say, hey, pastor, got the Holy Spirit living in me. You don't see him? <laughs> can't do it. I can't detect that. Only Jesus knows what's in a man's heart. But we can see this. We can see the evidence. And that would be important for Nicodemus. And that would be an important part of being born again. You need to be born of water. You need to have your sins forgiven. You need to be born of the Spirit. And you won't understand how that happens, but you'll see the effect of it. We don't know if Nicodemus ever got saved. In this, in this little part right here, it doesn't say. In fact, this is... You know, he didn't say a whole lot. And then after this, you never hear Nicodemus speak again. But you do hear later on that Nicodemus defends Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin. The Bible tells us that he stood up 
and, and stood up to the Pharisees, to the Sanhedrin, to the council, and defended Jesus in front of them. And then you see later on when Jesus was crucified, the Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and said, hey, I'd like to have Jesus' body. I've got a tomb here for him. And the Bible says that he and Nicodemus prepared Jesus' body for burial and placed him in a tomb. So we just, you got to believe by that, you, you begin to see some change in, in Nicodemus. You, need, you, you begin to see that he was breaking away from this, this works religious life that he was living to now following Jesus. Now, what's the point when you get here? Well, the whole point coming out of Ezekiel is unless you're born again, unless there's been a change in your heart, unless your sins have been removed, unless you have the Holy Spirit now living in you, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. It, it's, a, it's an internal work. Notice what, notice what happens here in verse 9. Here's the last thing, really, that we have recorded that Nicodemus says. How are these things possible? How are these things possible? Now, again, Nicodemus knew Ezekiel 36. I mean, the Pharisees didn't overlook Scripture in the Old Testament. They were studious. They were very diligent in knowing the law, knowing the Old Testament. How did he overlook this? Here's how he overlooked it. Pride. There's a lot of pride in righteousness. You've been around somebody that's self-righteous, kind of real high on their own righteousness. They tend to look down on others. They tend to put other people down. A humble man doesn't do that. We realize as a Christian, man, we're all sinners. Who am I to point my finger at somebody and point out their sin when I got a lot of sin in my own life? Nicodemus wasn't ready to be broken over his sin. He wasn't ready to come to Christ just as, he are, just as he is, which was a sinner in need of salvation. He was coming to God, flaunting his righteousness. So when it came to, you must be born again, you must start over again, it wasn't that Nicodemus didn't have the intellect to understand it. He had some head knowledge. He just wasn't willing to humble himself. Notice again what Jesus said. <laughs> I love this dialogue here. You're a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. Nicodemus needed to understand his religious credentials were not enough, and that being born again was everything he needed to have a relationship with God. Jesus goes on to say in verse 11, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. What was he doing? All Jesus was doing, and this is where we're going to stop. We'll pick up next week at verse 14. But all Jesus was doing is helping Nicodemus to understand who he was. Nicodemus still needed to embrace the fact that Jesus' words were authority, that he was God. You go back up and look at verse 2. We all know that God has sent you to teach us and that your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. No, <laughs> he is God. And that's all Jesus was saying. So let me go back to where I began. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Have you been born of water? Have you, have you come to that point of your life of admitting, realizing you're a sinner? You, you have nothing. You're spiritually bankrupt. You don't bring your, your, your good deeds and your works and, 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 and your religion to the Lord. You come before him just as you are, broken, Wounded, desperate, just what we sing. Maybe this morning you're ready to make that step of faith. I want to pause right here. I'll tell you where I've been struggling. Back in 
March when we uh, shut everything down for a few weeks. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know they were telling us a lot of people would die, so we, everybody panicked. So we were like, man, let's just stay away, just kind of, let's just not do church for a while. And then we came back, and we, we were given guidelines of what we need to be doing, being, you know, as cautious and wearing masks and just being aware that, hey, it's, it's here. And one of the things that we decided that we would change our invitation. Wasn't real wise to have people come to the front and, and get close and listen and talk and interact on, on that close of a level. So we thought, and we just probably don't need to do that. Now, I grew up Baptist, but I'm telling you, the invitation is not Baptist. It's really coming to the Scripture and knowing that that there's a response. And you don't have to come to the front of a church uh, to have the response. You can do it right where you are. You can do it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I mean, thief on the cross, there was no invitation. He, he just looked at Jesus, acknowledged who he was, and Jesus said, hey, today you're going to be with me in heaven. But I've been struggling about ending the service and going, hey, God bless you. See you next week. And it was a gentleman I told you about that had been in our service and God was dealing with him. He was like, what do I do? And we met with that gentleman. And I talked to you about him last week. Uh, his name was Scott Wells. And I, it just really got, un, I got under conviction of there's people maybe sitting here on a Sunday morning and it's like, I want to accept Christ. I'm ready. And so, we're going to initiate the invitation back again. Um, I just believe that, and I've had this confirmed. I had some people that have said, you know, I, I've been coming to your church, and I want to join, but how do you do that? I met with a man this week on Wednesday, and he, he said, you know, the week, I'm, I'm ready to join, Brother Ronnie, but I don't know what to do. No invitation thing, and so I met with him, and he joined the church in my office. I introduced him to our church last service. And so here's what, here's what I feel led. And our staff, we prayed about that this, this past Monday, is that uh, here's what we'll do. Uh, when we get to the end of a, a message like this and the gospel has been presented, the invitation has been given, which every Sunday will always be. If you don't know Jesus, the invitation is for you to accept him into your heart. Believe that he died on the cross, that, that when you turn from your sin and trust him as your Savior, he forgives you. It comes into your heart. You become a, a new creature. You're born again. That invitation is every Sunday, every time this book is open. If you'd like to join our church, maybe this is where God's leading you. You say, well, how do I do that? What, what, what's the steps? Or maybe you just need to pray with somebody. Maybe you got some questions. Maybe you got a burden. I had a guy come up at the 8 o'clock and just came up to me right at the end and just said, man, I just want you to pray. So here's what we're going to do. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you about this part. Many times when I'm standing down here and in the past when somebody has come up, and we're all singing. It's the invitation song, just like Just As I Am. Uh, I can't hear. It's like I'm talking to the person. They're going. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I can hear about every other word. I, I many times wanted to turn around and go, Tom, can you just keep it down a little bit? And I didn't want to do that to Jacob. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, when the service is over and everybody is facing that way, walking out, Kyle and I will be down front. And we'll stay. Jacob will come down. And we'll stay as long as we need to stay. For anybody that wants to come and talk, if we need to go somewhere, we've got a couple rooms on the side that after the, this service are not being used, and we'll go in there and just visit. We're going to have some other people that are going to help us in case there's, there's a family comes down and we need to just sit and visit with them and talk to their kids. And we just want to help. I don't want to end the service ever and just say, you know, God bless you. See you next Sunday. 
I want to say, man, we're here to, to join God in whatever he's doing. If you need to leave, if you're, you're like, man, I, God spoke to me, I'm ready to go out and be a witness. I'm ready to go out and serve the Lord. I, I know what I need to do. But if, if there's a way we can minister to you, that invitation will be given every Sunday. And you'll find us. I'm not going to go to the back, shake hands. I'm going to stay right down here up front. Kyle will be down here. Jacob will hang out. If Greg's in here, he'll hang out. There'll be people down here, the point is, to help you. So if you're ready this morning to be saved, and we dismiss, just come down and say, can we talk? <laughs> and I guarantee you, you'll have our attention. Undivided. Second part of that application this morning. Let's say you are born again. You answered that question, yes. You just didn't shout it out like the lady in the 8 o'clock service. But you're born again. What's your response? Two things. Worship. I mean, that's, that's, that's what people do that are born again. That's what you were saved. So that you now can worship a God that you have experience his love and his forgiveness in your life and you're going to do it now on this earth until you die and when you go to heaven guess what you're going to be in his presence and you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth in his presence hallelujah amen and the second thing worship witness witness remember john 1 andrew started following jesus what did he do when he got his brother Philip. Jesus said, hey, follow me, Philip. <laughs> I will. Man, I got a buddy. I, 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 he needs to be here. I'm going to go get Nathaniel. You're born again this morning. You got two things as an assignment. Go out of here as a worshiper and go out of here as a witness. So if you said this morning, I'm born again, pastor. I know Jesus lives in my heart. Then worship him every day and be a witness for him. Amen. Amen. We sang before this message, just as I am. I just think again in John 3 with the, this morning's focus on being born again, the invitation, if you've not been born again, to, to give Jesus your life. I'm, Jacob's going to come back and just going to close that. And then, as I said, Kyle and I will be right down front at the end when you're leaving we can help just come down and grab one of us jacob
This morning, if you need anything, we'll be down front. We'd love to talk with you. For those of you who are born again and know the Lord, let's go out into our mission field and be a worshiper and a witness today. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>